This is part three of Hot Mix Asphalt Paving Inspection. We'll examine the paving itself, delivering the HMA to the road, paver operation, placement procedures, inspection, documentation, and other related concerns. In part two, you saw the wide range of construction activities and inspection concerns in preparing roadways for hot mix asphalt paving. Whether the surface to be paved is a new subgrade, an old concrete pavement with repair joints, or an existing HMA surface that's been cold milled, it must be well prepared for paving. In general, that means free of defects and properly covered with bond coat. Paving preparation also entails placing traffic controls, alignments and grade controls, achieving density, and making good joints. And depending on the roadway, it often means the raising of structures. Before bond coat is applied, the surface joints and cracks must be thoroughly cleaned. Dirt, loose pavement, particles, and construction debris of all sorts must be completely removed. The contractor is required to use compressed air to blow loose material out of the cracks and joints. He may use it to clean off the rest of the surface too. Machines are typically employed in the cleanup, especially power brooms. In urban areas, however, vacuum type sweepers should be used to avoid raising clouds of dust and throwing debris against buildings and parked cars. A small spray of water is used to cut down on the dust while sweeping. If the surface is too dirty, a water truck may be used to help clean the surface. In any case, the objective is to remove all loose and unwanted material that will interfere with the proper bond coat application and the subsequent paving. The cleaning may even uncover other problems, such as this exposed reinforcing steel that should be cut off and removed before bond is applied to the pavement edge. The next step is the bond coat application. Now we'll look at the delivery of the mix. Good pavements don't begin with the placement of the hot mix asphalt on the road. They start at the plant with the making of the mix. The mix design and plant production of hot mix asphalt is a whole training subject by itself. Remember, without high quality mix, you won't get a high quality pavement. Your concern as a paving inspector is that the loads of mix maintain their quality during delivery from the plant to placement on the roadway. Trucks used for transporting hot mix asphalt must have beds that are tight, clean, and smooth. If it is necessary to use a release agent in the truck bed, never use diesel fuel. It will break down the asphalt cement in the mix and is environmentally unsafe. And at placement, watch for evidence of excessive release agent. Reject the load if too much has been used. Then the truck is loaded with mix, either from a batch plant or a surge bin. The load is then covered as required by law. Trucks are covered to completely protect the mixture from the weather and to retard the loss of heat. Different types of trucks comprise the haul units, from tandem axle dump trucks to larger double bottom dump trucks to the even larger live bottom feeders. Once the haul units are loaded and covered as necessary, the driver picks up the haul ticket and heads for the road. There are no time limitations for delivery of the mix, but every load must be maintained at the specified target temperature. 
At the job site, watch the truck activity. It should not interfere with traffic, create a hazard on the project, or hurt the quality of the work. If it does, the problem should be corrected immediately. Each haul unit should be positioned in front of the paver. It should back to within a few feet of the paver's roller bars and then wait for the paver to move forward and make contact. Both roller bars should make firm contact with both sets of dual truck tires at the same time. If only one roller bar is in contact, only one side of the paver does the pushing. This will cause the paver to skew and to shudder or jerk. The paver will then pave in an irregular line and not produce the regular mat. Be sure the trucks don't bump or back into the paver when they back up. Bumping the paver could create a dip in the mat. As each truckload arrives at the paver, the haul ticket is collected from the driver and the information checked. The collected tickets provide the type of mix and tonnage being placed on the roadway, and this becomes an essential part of the project documentation. Record the temperatures on the load tickets. Communicate with the plant to increase or decrease the target temperature, as on-site conditions may warrant. Measure the mix temperature often enough to verify that the loads are within the acceptable limits. You can permit occasional loads slightly outside of the plus or minus 20 degree limits, as long as adjustments are being made to bring the temperature back to target. Reject any load that's below 250 degrees or greater than plus or minus 20 degrees from the maximum mixing temperature specified by the binder producer at the time of discharge from the truck. The ability to recognize deficiencies in the HMA mixtures comes from experience, but there are some basic visual signs that you should be able to distinguish. Some of the indicators include the mix being too hot or too cold, excessive moisture, texture, segregation, or changes in the mix's workability. Consult the construction manual for specific definitions. As we get into the paving operations themselves and the related inspections, let's first look at the different hot mix asphalt courses, base, leveling, and top. Hot mix asphalt base courses are typically placed as part of new roadway construction or in conjunction with widening projects. Underlying this base is a sub-base. While the requirements for placing the first layer of base courses are not as stringent as the upper layers of HMA pavement, you still need to check the depth, width, horizontal, and vertical alignment of the mat. Use the maximum application rate in Table 501-4 of the standard specifications or with the engineer's approval. A road widening machine is independently used to place shoulders. Shoulders may also be placed at the same time that leveling and top courses are replaced by using an extended auger and screed on the paver. Leveling courses and hot mix asphalt pavements serve to eliminate unevenness in the underlying surface and provide a smooth, regular foundation on which to place the top course having the desired grade and cross section. Whether for new construction or on resurfacing jobs, leveling courses must meet the same basic requirements as for top courses, as given the specs. Top courses naturally must meet the highest standards in terms of line, grade, width, thickness, cross-section, density, and surface quality. For both top leveling courses, the paver is required to have an automatically controlled and activated screed and strike-off assembly, except when paving shoulders and widenings less than eight feet wide. 
From here on, the paving procedures and inspections will apply to any hot mix asphalt course unless otherwise stated. With truckloads of mix on the way to the project, or already arrived and waiting, the paver is moved into position. In this case, to start paving at a butt joint. Then the screed is heated. Heating the screed to a temperature near that of the mix prevents the mix from sticking to the screed, and it helps the paver place the mat smoothly with an even textured surface. The screed should be adjusted properly for the mix to flow smoothly under it. The cross section produced after final rolling shall meet the project plan's typical cross section as specified. Using a string line and ruler, have the contractor's crew measure and adjust the crown before paving begins. To check the settings during paving, look at the gauge on the back of the paver. It gives an approximate indication. the paver will be coming off a butt joint. To start the paving, shims should first be set down. Shims are pieces of wood or metal with the thickness appropriate for the last depth of mat to be placed. The screed is lowered to rest up on them. And with a hopper full of mix, the paver moves forward. Usually some handwork is needed at the joint. Here are some excess mixes shoveled off the mat. And the joint is looted to leave it clean and even for the rollers. The paver's speed is important. You should work with the contractor to determine a speed that will provide a continuous paving operation and a smooth pavement mixture. In any case, the paver's speed should be coordinated with the production rate of the plant, and more importantly, with the number of haul trucks delivering the hot mix asphalt to the paver. Stopping and starting the paver should be minimized. Basically, you want to see the paver move fast enough to place the maximum amount of pavement, but slow enough to avoid pulling or tearing at the mat. Except for certain conditions, Pavers are required to use an automatically controlled and activated screed, capable of grade reference and transverse slope control. An approved grade reference attachment, which is 30 feet or more in length, is used for all lower courses and the first pass of the top course. The contractor should receive approval from the engineer prior to the use of any proposed alternate grade reference and attachment. After the first pass of the top course has been placed, a joint matcher, or a 10-foot or longer grade referencing attachment, may be substituted for constructing subsequent adjacent passes of the top course with prior approval of the engineer. The paver slope control can be set to lay a mat with a cross slope specified by the plans, or established on the job to satisfy existing conditions. The paver's operator usually controls the alignment of the paver. On this resurfacing project, the operator visually aligns the guide mark on the bar extending from the hopper with marks spray painted on the pavement. A string may have to be used if there is no definite line to follow. Let's follow the flow of the mix to look more closely at paver operations. Whether from dump trucks, or from conveyor type haul units, the mix is transferred to the paver's hopper. The mix should be dumped into the center of the hopper with care not to overload the hopper and spill the mix on the base. The mix is carried by the conveyor through the flow control gates and back to the screed unit. Some pavers have control gate indicators that show the position of the control gates, high or low. The lower the lift gates are set, the more they restrict the flow of mix, causing the augers to turn continuously and spread the mix wider. So, as a rule, the wider the paving width, the lower the control gate should be. 
Pavers, such as this one, have a sonar detector that senses the amount of mix in front of the auger, telling the auger when to turn and when to stop. In part one, we talked about the requirements for screed and auger extensions. On the job, you should be sure they operate properly, just like the main screed in the auger. The best way to tell if they're operating smoothly is to inspect the results behind the paver, the fresh mat. You want to see an even, smooth surface without holes, streaks, tears, rust spots, or other visible defects. Part of your visual inspection is to note the quality of the longitudinal joints. There are two types, tapered and bumped. When the top course is constructed with a taper joint, the adjacent lane will be placed so that it overlaps this joint. The tapered overlapping longitudinal joint is constructed by tapering the HMA mat. The taper has a 1 to 12 ratio of mat thickness to slope. For example, a 2 inch mat thickness would require a 24 inch taper. The tapered portion of the mat is constructed by the use of an approved strike-off device that will provide a uniform slope and will not restrict the main screen. The adjacent lane must be paved within 24 hours unless delayed by inclement weather. The paver is equipped with a weighted roller equaling width to the taper and is applied to the taper section of the pavement to provide initial compaction. Before the adjacent lane is placed, the tapered edge of the first lane must be coated with an application of bond along with the rest of the surface to be paved. Then the second lane is placed, overlapping the first tapered. Final density requirements for the entire pavement, including the temporary, will remain unchanged. Where tapered longitudinal joints are not specified or allowed, vertical longitudinal joints are constructed. When placing HMA in a lane adjoining a previously placed lane, the mixture is placed such that it minimally overlaps the first lane and is placed to a height above the cold mat, equal to the breakdown roller depression on the hot mat. Where lanes are constructed by two or more pavers working in echelon, the loose depths of mix from each paver must match at the longitudinal joint or second pass slightly higher and unrolled. Echelon paving can be done on a newly constructed roadway or when traffic is detoured completely off the roadway that is to be paved. In this process of paving, two pavers move independently of each other, but at the same time work together to pave the full width of the roadway or pave a lane and full width shoulder. Grade referencing is typically done with a sonar sonic, a non-contacting grade referencing system. The second paver references off the hot mix placed by the first paver, and will also have its own grade referencing system. The center line, or the edge of roadway and shoulder where the HMA is combined between two pavers, will form a blended joint. This is called a hot joint. After the final rolling, there should be no detectable joint line. Another key point is that the rollers need to stay behind their own rolling spread so as not to cross over the crown point. This could alter or even remove the crown point. Both pavers used in echelon paving need to be kept as close to one another as possible, maximum distance 300 feet of each paver. Truck management of the mixed delivery is another concern for the contractor. Material needs to be delivered to the operation to enable continuous paving without any stopping and waiting. This will affect the ride quality of the project. And at the end of the paving day, the night joint must be finished at the same point to eliminate a cold longitudinal joint. Hot mix asphalt paving must often be done in difficult places. 
along curb and gutter spaces, at intersections, around catch basins, manholes, and other structures, in transition areas next to guardrails, tight spots, varying slopes, difficult grades to match, there are all kinds of problems to solve. Take curb and gutter for example. The HMA pavement needs to match the grade of the top edge of the gutter to allow the roadway to drain properly. Of course, because rolling will compress the fresh mix, the mat should be higher than the gutter initially. Even after the roller compacts this edge of the mat, it should remain a quarter inch higher than the gutter. Paving intersections, the round curb radii is especially tough. Even with extending screeds and skillful operators, lots of manual work must be done. Constructing HMA pavement around drainage structures requires great skill and careful inspection. Such areas are often inaccessible and the mix must be placed manually. Where the paver can pave over the structures, the covers should first be coated with release agent to facilitate removing the mix after the paver has gone by. In either case, skillful handwork is needed to make tight connections and smooth transition between pavement and structure top. Because the paver responds slowly, the manual thickness adjustments must be made well in advance. Slope indications were spray painted on the shoulder ahead of time to guide the crew. In transitions of slope, the automatic controls can be turned off. The mat thickness can be controlled manually, but not by guesswork. Let's take a look at the inspections that are made to ensure quality pavements. Earlier, we covered mix temperature. Your other main concerns are for depth, width, slope, grade, surface quality, alignment, and yield of the pavement. Density and coring is also important. The loose depth of the fresh mat should be enough to result in a compacted value of the main course of the planned thickness. The contractor's crew should frequently probe the mat behind the paver to check its depth. You should monitor their checks, but also do your own wherever and whenever you want to verify the course thickness before and after compaction. If necessary, corrective adjustments must be made to bring the pavement within plan yield. Check the width of the mat at intervals too. It should conform with the plan requirements or fit the field conditions as appropriate. To check the slope of the mat, use a carpenter's level and a rule. Rest one end of the carpenter's level on the pavement transversely to the center line. Raise or lower the other end until the bubble is centered. Then measure from the bottom edge of the level down to the surface. Divide the vertical measurement in feet by the length of the level. For example, 8 hundredth of a foot divided by a 4 foot level indicates a slope of 2 hundredth of a foot or 2%. The grade of the surface may be determined in a variety of ways. At this widening lane, the grade will be checked by measuring from a string line stretched from the edge of the curb to the existing roadway. On new construction projects without curb and gutter, a string line can be stretched between grade stakes or from a graded string line set to guide the paver. Where the top course is in a curb and gutter section, check for a consistent quarter inch height of the compacted mat above the edge of the gutter. It is important to have a good quality mat surface in both appearance and actual smoothness. There should be no streaks, open textured areas, rough spots, gouges, unevenness, and so on. Problems of these sorts may be caused by improper screed settings defective mix, or poor workmanship. Any problems need to be corrected. 
A 10-foot straight edge is used to find out if the surface is within the prescribed tolerance, according to MTM 722. The variation of the top course must not exceed the limits of 1 8 inch in 10 feet. For lower courses, it's 1 quarter inch, and it's the same for single course construction. For base courses, the tolerance is 3 fourths of an inch on lower courses, and 3 eighths of an inch on the top of the base course. You should frequently double check for proper alignment and width of the mat with a tape measure. The mat should follow a smooth and steady line that is pleasing in appearance. Just look down the edges of the mat, especially at the center line. Any material exceeding the plan width, which results in a ledge, will be corrected at the contractor's expense. Finally, check the yield of the mix as it's placed the pounds of mix per square yard placed. Approximate checks can be made by measuring the thickness of the unrolled mat and allowing for compaction. A measured thickness of one inch of rolled mix represents a yield of about 110 pounds per square yard. More accurate yield checks by calculation should be made often at the beginning of the day. The first one should be made after 500 to 600 linear feet of mix has been placed. Simply convert the tons of mix placed to pounds and then divide by the square yards covered. If the checks reveal the yield to be several pounds high or low, direct the contractor to slightly adjust the thickness. If using automation, allow five toe lengths of the paver to automatically make the adjustment. Check the correctness of the yield with a ruler. Then check the yield after another five to 600 feet has been placed. Continue this procedure until it's been determined what thickness of the unrolled mat will give the required yield. Thereafter, periodic yield checks of the unrolled mat thickness will be enough to determine if the correct yield is being maintained. Now a word about your documentation of the paving and inspection. Complete the form inspector's daily report in the field managing software program. Record the required information and other facts or information you feel are significant to the job. Be thorough, neat, and accurate. Throughout the paving operations, ensure good traffic control. Make sure that the contractor maintains the signs, arrow boards, and other devices that were set up properly when the paving began, and that they are repositioned whenever necessary. Flaggers should be properly attired and equipped and should know how to control the traffic and deal tactfully with the public. On HMA construction, where traffic is being maintained, all equipment working within the project limits, including cold milling machines, distributors, and rollers, must be equipped with at least one approved flashing, rotating, or oscillating amber light. Pavers must be equipped with at least one such light on each side of the paver. The lights are mounted so that the warning signal will be visible to traffic in all directions. Hauling units must activate four-way flashers within the project limits, and the lights must be in operation when the work is in progress. A difficult aspect of paving in urban areas is maintaining the public's access to businesses and residences. As inspector, be sure that the contractor keeps access open to the degree practical. Also, be sure that the contractor plans the work so that at day's end, all lanes are placed within one truckload of the same point of ending, except when longitudinal tapered joints are being made. In part four, we'll get into rolling operations, including coring for density acceptance. Also, more coverage of joint construction, as well as a look at pavement markings.